the quarrel. Well, class, we were trying to make some sense of the quarrel the last time we met. You may remember. And the reason for our doing that was my belief that war works in history the way the quarrel works in a marriage, or somewhat the way a feud functions in a backward society. I never meant to suggest that nations at war must have been in love with one another once, but obviously every case of military conflict involves a vital relationship which has gone or is going sour. Wars don't necessarily make permanent enemies any more than quarrels do. We are friendlier with the Japanese now than we were before the Pacific War. I pointed out that like quarrels too, the loser may not be the loser. Results are deceptive. If the American Civil War was, as some think, a conflict between industry and agriculture, then, given the pressures of history, industry would have won its war, whether the North did or not. Actually, at the most pertinent level of historical abstraction, i.e. time, this war simply signified the birth pangs of the 20th century. For our century, was born a few weeks before Appomattox in 1865, in front of the logs at Bloody Angle, where Grant invented victory by means of material superiority and attrition. That century lasted until 1945 and died its dumb brute's death at Hiroshima when Harry Truman ordered the sorry epoch destroyed. That wasn't wise, in my opinion, because the 20th century was to be ours, and ours alone, while it lasted, awful as it was. Centuries are no longer those genial at 150 years stretches which we once enjoyed. Centuries now are considerably shorter. The lifespan of eras approaches 50. Anyway, my point was, that the new age will arrive willy-nilly like a weight in a void. Where was I? In the pit. I work with a wet handkerchief across my face because in that cramped space it takes only a few blows to raise dust enough to engulf me. Surely deep dirt will be less powdery, more like earth and less like air. I suffer from black snot now. Martha has begun to watch me wash. My most recent aperçu is that jailers are jealous of the freedom of their prisoners. If we had the true and complete history of one man, which would be the history of his head, we would sign the warrants and end ourselves forever not because of the wickedness we would find within that man, no, but because of the meagerness of feeling, the miniaturization of meaning, the pettiness of ambition, the vulgarities, the vanities, the diminution of intelligence, the endless trivia we'd encounter, the ever-present dust. I need better tools. I need goggles, picks and shovels, an auger, gloves, flash, hard hat, mask? Or should I be sporting and create my own excavation equipment out of sardine tins and bedspring wire? It is already obvious, isn't it, that Germany was not the loser of our last European war if we set aside her present schizophrenia. Great Britain was. All that's left of it is England, like a set of trophy antlers. Martha always wants to play some stupid tune or other to honor Harry Truman, but I've glued two of the white keys together, and I want to watch her face cloud the next time she plays the Missouri Waltz. It is probably too late to fight back, yet I have to do something. Life has come to an unquiet stall, and I am gathering dust like the rest of her ruck. We were so commodious once, but this house has eaten itself small, 
stuffed as it is now with outsized Victoriana and malevolent gigaws. Dressers, like a line of sideshow fatties, crowd one upstairs hall, each one haunted by its ranks of empty drawers. I am myself an outsized malevolent gigaw. I sit here and stare at the machine, which makes me go on. I shall need identity papers, passport, map. Ah, what a task my dreams have drawn me into. Men heave chiffoniers and wardrobes into this house as if it were a haven for the second hand. Martha wipes them off and cleans them out and neatly lines all the drawers with fresh old newspaper. She measures them and places them, finally, here and there, where they draw rectangles around their inner darkness, sustaining out of sight and far from breathing a kind of closet air. As far as I can see, she stores nothing in them. I shall need a compass, matches in a waterproof container, cardboard suitcase, some sort of story, a little string or twine. Cultures exist in different times and climates, like the stars, and that class is our present misery. I carry on the spirit of Flaubert, but even he has a heavy corpse. I shall not quote Flaubert to this crowd or mention any other hater of mankind. Take a vacation from your constant confrontations, I tell them. Lift your noses from your beer, get off the pot, Forsake a sit-in for a thoughtful walk. Go deep into the country some quiet Sunday, away from loud talk, sing-alongs, bullhorns, gropes, and the cops. Stand still as a listening animal and listen. Then you will hear it. Time's labored breathing, somewhat like the sea's heave, the death rattle of history. Vietnam, dear me, you've frightful manners and no perspective. You read one word and think you recognize the world. Vietnam is simply the latest in our lengthy run of Asian wars. These will conclude with the downfall of the West and the collapse of European culture. Ho oh, hum, who cares? but you don't think of yourselves as Europeans, do you? You simple Illini, you down-home Hoosiers, you cornrow Hawkeyes, God, no, you've put away your past like a moth-balled fleet. Yet, sad to say, you are Europe's last legs. You've got to stop watching the second hand and look at the slow sweep of the centuries, at what the Greeks began and where Rome reached. Governale is right. Our culture has always ridden on the forward flow of the future, and you were its leading edge, my little darlings. Even that dolly from Elkhart with her skirt hiked halfway to her navel? Oh, hum, who cares? Halfway from where? One day will her cunt crack open and a hero bellow his way into being. What a miracle that would be. Time after time, time has turned upon itself, and the past has overtaken the present as if to say, there shall be no tomorrow unless it is yesterday. Christianity, a Semitic substance never forget, seeped into the pagan bloodline like a pollutant into a stream and sickened the mind. It perverted that Greek world word logos with which every rational thought begins and darkened its outline. Although the Islamic threat was turned back, Christianity and Judaism sullied those white Roman robes with their benighted mysticisms. Then finally, my simple friends, and the way you behave, I cannot approach you without condescension. The European head began to clear the ideas of Greece, 
became our proper ideals again. The clouds rolled back. The sun appeared upon a peal of trumpets. And the word was rescued from monastic servitude, from writing, and returned to the mouth again. The soul sang. Remember, every real rebirth is physical, pagan, pantheistic, positivist, philosophical fun. Good heavens, hear me. I've got my Plan Man T voice turned on. Our forefathers, who brought forth, as we say, this country, were themselves the product of the Enlightenment, the children of reason. But now, now, you don't know when our Asian wars began, of course, in those little teenage Balkan rumbles, in those piddly disputes which nevertheless drove the Turks out of Tripoli, for example, and kept the coastal lands of the Mediterranean largely European. Austria had already declared war on Serbia to set off another petty Balkan cuddle-muddle when the Russians started to mobilize along the German and Austrian frontiers. Learning this, as it was intended they should, the German government sent the Tsar a shut-up shop sign, and when this friendly ultimatum was ignored, the first Asian war began. Play brawl, Culp shouts down the length of the corridor upon hearing the sirens outside. That was August 1st, 1914, a nice simple date, a simple time. The fighting in France, which some film may have made familiar to you, was a civil war, really. West versus West, a badly managed divorce case and it obscured the true causes, conditions, character, and consequences of the conflict in the East. World War II, about which even more movies have been made, and about which you therefore have even more misinformation, was also deceptively cut, this time into three racial and regional pieces, so that when the Germans invaded Russia again, the action was not immediately seen as the grand opening of the Second Asian War. Nor was the fighting in the Pacific, which followed almost immediately afterward, properly numbered three. The fourth, of course, we fought in Korea. No trouble noticing that. And so yours, kids, is the fifth. The fifth. It's been a long bout. We lost the first two rounds. We were confused, you see, about our purposes and our real opponent. We won the third rather decisively and fought the fourth to a draw. But we have begun to tire in the fifth. We are well behind on points by this time. Our enemy is patient, in better shape, and prepared for a long fight. We appear to have lost the small heart we had. Peace, yes, peace to the daffodils, the daisies. You flower children are ready for the vases. Dope is just one of the enemy's weapons. Has been for ages. Ho-hum, eh? Then why the rages? Ah, but you only hate what's going on in the world because it interferes with your indifference. I understand. With you... Love is a benevolent indolence. Your professor, however, your pompous, overbearing, scornful, behind-the-times professor, has not had an indifferent moment in his life. You shake fistfuls of noise and run about in the streets, carrying signs like peddlers. You burn down a shanty and call it rebellion. You parade and call it protest. You go grimace to grimace with the pigs and celebrate your confrontation. But I, who fought in the good war, who had my heave on crystal knocked, I look at you sitting in front of me, and I see secretaries and office boys, post-bomb, pre-boom babies. You should have those initials blazoned on your banners, PB, PB. Perhaps I shall design one for you. 
Then, if I can find a compliant Betsy, you'll be in business. That's where you want to be, honestly, isn't it? At IBM, at AT&T. Have you burned a single Reichstag? Smashed a single pane of glass? Betrayed a friend for the cause? Beaten someone bloody or broken up a rally? Burn books, bone up on bricks and stones. For the future, you lack every preparation. You say you oppose the military-industrial complex, and yet you haven't tipped over one lonely phone booth. Do you realize what the age of the mass man means? Mass man means mass management. Are you ready for that? For furorship by committee? The collective comrade means that we shall crap in concert and spread the music on our fields. On your banners, because of the way they'll look when they waffle in the wind, I think you need your bees to be a little ragged or pointed, perhaps, like pennants. Mass man means mass murder. Put that on your boom baby bunting. Mass man means mass murder. Can that qualify as a slob web? Could be a culpogram, but probably it's only a slow con. Holocaust, Hiroshima, warm-up tosses in the bullpen dairies. I should try to find out the name of the young woman with the inviting thighs. She's been sitting too long with her mini around her maxi for that show to be accidental. Maybe she wants me to get up to something. The true enemy of... What should the colors of the banners be? Underwear white? Panty pink. We need to establish a condom sanitaire, Culp says. There is no penalty for pinching back the future. What is the German word for never being there? That human life is of infinite worth, ought never to be wasted or taken, but always revered, is now a wardrobe too expensive to dry clean. Who is not a member of the mass, you ask? Though not a hand went up, I answer anyway. Those who detach themselves from it as a piece of potter's clay is taken from the ground. Those who seek freedom and individuality, who refuse to believe on block or act on cue, who reject regimentation, decline membership in the order or the club, live alone and don't cooperate, throw their trash under the house, let dishes pile up in the sink, sleep in cat's stink. A man's solemn duty now is to cast his seed upon the ground, where it will poison the soil like salt. Nature's way of safely decreasing the population is to increase the numbers of queers, queers of all kinds, bachelors, old maids, monks, masturbators, butchers, buggerers, suck-offs, idiosyncrats. We are even subdividing Hades. Busloads of Japanese tourists picnic in the pit. The steaming lakes are much admired, although the prohibition of photography is not understood and consequently resented. Anvils arrive with comforting irregularity, occasionally striking a bus, which then explodes its people like pus from a boil. Each person bursts in turn, and cameras fly out of the nose and eyes. The cameras disintegrate in motions apparently slowed. Lengths of film unfurl like narrow flags. Images such as those which infect the mind's eye leap from the flaming spools while uttering gray outcries and other prognostications. The end of the world is at hand. Students sigh in their snoozes while I rhythmically slap my right palm on the podium, alert to sidestep a skirt slide. Her name will turn up on a class list, Carol Adam Spindley, 
I wonder how many male members in my class are erect. Not many, I suspect, except for a few boners due only to boredom. I've known those. The blood falls asleep in the prick. All right, all right. But the orchestra, as Culp says, is in the pit. Susu is in the pit. She wears a slit-length dress, the color of Carol's carpet. Sing, Susu, sing. She sings. I love the arm of my man around me, above the arm of my man. My heart is pounding. The Quarrel Every war has its distant causes and conditions. We've gone over that. It is absolutely necessary that these factors remain hidden and continue undisturbed, because if they are once dragged into the light and confronted, their nature realized, all restraints will be snapped, all principles forsworn. Neither unconditional surrender, total war, nor blitzkrieg will do. None of that kindergarten temporizing. Only extirpation, only utter cancellation, the Carthaginian solution, the blot that blots out its blotting. We've gone over that. Never look beneath the surface of life, because beneath the surface of life you will not find neat schools of gently swimming fish, seaweed swaying, as Culp claims, to water music, or even cicadas somewhere in their seven years' sleep, or moles stubbornly contriving their succulent runnels. Beneath the surface of life is the pit, the abyss, the awful truth, a truth that cannot be lived with, that cannot be abided, human worthlessness, our worthlessness, yours and mine. So what the hell? The anvils do not burst when they hit, as the buses do when hit by the anvils. The anvils plunge out of sight in the soft earth the lakes also lie on, earth made of muscle, calloused skin, and organ flesh, boneless as some hams. The pit is a grave made of man. The fires feed on his subcutaneous fat. So a background complaint must be readied, you say, some grievance which will be brought forward eventually during the terminal dilly-dallying which makes up the fight as the real, the finely honest reason for the quarrel. This surrogate must be substantial, it must be persuasive, but it must be a bright red herring as well. I have lost a Roman numeral somewhere, V for the V between... What sort of name is Carol Adam Spindley? Next a signal must be sent, di 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 da which will alert one's fellow quarrelee, if only at some subliminal level, to the fact that the weather will soon be foul, that their companion is not as sweetly companionable as she or he seems, so that in the secrecy of still another self the soul may begin to arm. I love the mouth of my man up on me, above the mouth of my man my heart is pounding. The next factor we are obliged to list, although we must awkwardly approach the bottom of the board, is the customarily trivial, deviously displaced, igniting cause, some little stupidity which sets the explosion off and which puts its instigator immediately in a childish light and sounds the tantrum's tone. Our provocateur realizes at the very moment of commitment that he or she has poured wrath into the wrong cup, gone off prematurely, put climax before penetration, 
and this mistake increases the general grievance both parties feel, one senselessly put upon, the other shamed. Although quarrels regularly get off on the wrong foot, that foot is nevertheless in the right shoe. For there is always a connection, hidden perhaps, yet altogether essential, between the surrogate and the source first of all, and then again between the detonator and the nature of its demolition. Every quarrel requires at least the tacit complicity of the quarrelers, for nothing ends a quarrel sooner than surrender. Whenever there is direct retaliation for some real and mutually recognized wrong, there is no quarrel either. Gray, even when he is not dressed in gray, Herschel goes dismayingly well with this gray day. Tuesdays are terrible because the mail is always skimpy, local leaflets, memos, drugstore coupons, bills arriving as if set adrift in the gutter across the street. Yet, in spite of the carrier's lighter load, late, late. And this afternoon, the overcast is like dust. It is as if the entire earth were descending into my tunnel, filling it to overflowing, as if. For the hole I've dug is scarcely bigger than a basin. But a beginning, didn't I say, a beginning to my inscape. Then why is my heart no longer light? Because two days have passed, and it is still Tuesday. Because the legs of my love sir round me, so my heart is pounding. Surely I've not gone on mooning the loss of Lou. No. My relationship with Culp is almost wholly one of tiresome repartee, but I customarily try to talk some sense into dear gray Henry Herschel. And it's not because ideas slide right off him that I fail, although he is all slope. No, ideas stick to Herschel like snot. He is a little dog-jowled, a bit pigeon-breasted, a little likewise toad. With clothes he cannot be fitted. His head is so much bigger than the rest of him it appears to float above his neck like a balloon on a stick. And his round eyes watch your every move, open as an owl's are sometimes, and he likes to bring them up close to you, as if by peeking through yours he'd see a secret. However, his frame shrinks from anything physical, from contact that near and neighborly. His feet stand their small ground stubbornly, so Herschel leans toward you like a rake against a tree. And since he is of only average height, his eyes, so close and large, need to tilt up slightly toward yours, to which they seem drawn then, like leaves to light. I remember only one other head like his. It belonged to the superintendent of schools in my hometown. Was Trifocal his name? He had diabetes. What sort of name is Carol Adam whatever? A big man, though, unlike Herschel, who is a water tank on top of two sticks. Tri-Tiff-Tiffany? Trivogel moved like molasses, and his lids seemed always about to close. A huge round head, not a bit of pudge upon it, and it was that large, slow figure my mother kept expecting me to return in triumph to replace. Tribunal? He had a habit of falling asleep in public, at meetings, banquets, plays, the scandal was sustained by his loris-like look. Herschel has a similarly heavy head, large lids, but his eyes are wide and wondering. If his feet would bring his body closer, he could pour that full wet gaze of his like syrup down upon my neck and nose. 
I've had to hunt up Herschel in order to head off this little burgeoning conspiracy concerning my pet dunce, Lacelli, Lacelli the Belly, the most warlike small man since my father and Jimmy Cagney slapped that movie dame. A true punk. With a grapefruit, was it? A true punk. But my own, my own slow, glowing coal, my personal thread of smoke, to hang a fuse from. And Herschel always stands up to greet me, shakes my hand as if we had not seen one another since the beginning of summer, waves me to the one seat available as if I might be really wondering where to put my ass, smiles a smile of honest pleasure at my actually entering his office instead, as it usually happens, of Herschel having to float like a fog by mine, drifting in through an incautiously open door with nothing immediate on his mind, nothing specific to say, just gathering near me to mood up my life, cloud my day, waiting for me to open my mouth so he can rain down reservations. Hello, Hershey. How's it? It is impossible, not to say nettlesome, to carry on a debate with Herschel, because he is invariably prepared to grant you your point, after he has blunted it. He is quick to applaud your overall attitude, for the most part, of course, on the whole, by and large, in the main. Meanwhile, he has so effectively clouded the countryside that you can never perceive the defining edge of anything or circumscribe an ordinary outline in order to locate its elbows or touch its tits. Blur, fuzz, smear, that's what he does, his specialty. It's not that, like Governale, he hates distinctions, but rather that he makes too many and lays them down on top of one another repeatedly like an angry scratch-out of lines. On the other hand, you can never come to an accord either, sing harmony, not with good king qualification, handsome prince perhaps, not with Mr. Maybe, not with kid yes but, not with every idea developed as an endless polyhedron. No, you cannot quarrel with Herschel, yet the hedgehog lets nothing pass. If thoughts wore ties, he'd always feel compelled in his wifely way to straighten them. So with Herschel, one is habitually in a state of mitigated exasperation. Lecelli, the dolus belly, deplorable twerp, hard, shiny, well-shaped little tummy like an overturned metal mixing bowl. It shines through his shirts. A small, smeary mustache, which he's cut from photographs of his heroic master poseur, struggles to survive on a pitted, unerable lip. He frigs its greasy ends, but to no avail. They will not even form points, let alone stand stiff. He doesn't dare do the denunzio goatee, and I think he's receding his hairline with a raspy eraser. I fancy he wears a blue cape borrowed from a nursey doll when he lays his bonnie barley on her ample back. Bonnie barley, ex-sec, ex-stew, ex-wife of an account exec she met on a flit from Shy to L.A., she is now a simple student of Italian disunion, especially, I believe, of the late kingdom of Naples. That's what she and Lacelli have in common, besides their hardcore commonness. But it's Lacelli's strut that gets me. It's his dimpled dandification I can't abide, his come-and-get-it, tough-guy, hand-on-gun-butt stance. The stare he turns up and down rheostatically behind a pair of imaginary airman's goggles, his tromping about in tennis shoes as if he were wearing boots, dedicating his unwritten books to Bonnie Barley as if she were Donna Agrisola Gravina di Romaca or some 
other similarly dubbed and bubbied Sicilian slut. As Culp says, she's a soft tush. Hi, Hirsch. What say? The Quarrel the quarrel not only has definite operating elements, which I have written on the blackboard with a squeaky chalk, it has several successive, almost necessary stages. During the first, the preparatory signal is sent, or rather, a number of signals are sent and received. These are like subliminal warnings. Above the restless and barren flood of normal life, as it were, in place of the peaceful dove, the leaf-laden harbinger of land, hawks with pieces of bone in their beaks are sighted. We got plenty of such signals from the Japanese, but we suppressed them because we knew we needed to be surprised. Most of the time, one party is first to alert the other, but when the quarrel finally breaks out, accusations will be rapidly bandied. Well, you started it. I started it? You started it. You are the one who... Jesus, I don't believe it. You can stand there and lie like that? As if you've forgotten already? When? Just now. Jesus. Some of this righteous amazement will be genuine, because the messages may have been transmitted hours before, and their significance scarcely conscious even then, since suppressed. Hence the startled outrage with which the commencement of hostilities is customarily greeted. Among couples and even countries, one is usually the aggressor, while the other invites the aggression. These roles are conveniently forgotten each time. Everyone pretends not to know their part or the title of the play. So the second phase, as I've said, consists of a quarrel about who it was who started the quarrel. It is a kind of warm-up quarrel and sets the initial agenda. Of course, the idea is to fix the blame for everything upon the person who broke the peace and not upon the factors and forces responsible for the massive hidden grievances whose bumbling collision is being so rambunctiously but deceptively registered nor at this point will any acceptable or plausible substitute cause for the quarrel be advanced, tramps passing their shapes safely through hooked screens, since the substitute cause must appear to be lying under, not over, circumstances. Otherwise it cannot be discovered, revealed, or admitted. The day my father discovered that my mother was offering strong drink to vagrants, there was a terrible quarrel, one of the worst in my memory, my father's voice low and choked with words as if they were debris obstructing a flood, my mother pale and pouty, eyes slowly filling with tears like a leaking boat, silence her only defense, except when, with a desperate giggle, and a defiant flip of her head, she tossed back the jigger of gin which still stood on the kitchen counter. That glass his finger had been firing his feelings at. So he subsequently forced her, in place of her own dinner, to sit on the back stoop and eat the meal she had prepared for the tramp. Most times I think the kid here is the shiftless layabout, he told her in tones as measured as powder for a bomb. But you are the real beggar, the real bum, the total good for nothing in this house. On the back step, beside a spoon at rest in a wide red bowl, she sat for an hour in the evening light like a heap of thrown clothes. The Quarrel the third stage might be called a quarrel proper, although quarrels are, by nature, repetitive and recursive. Early injuries are re-inflicted, earlier remarks are returned to center stage, bite after bite is taken from the same piece of already rent flesh. 
how protracted any quarrel is, whether it becomes physically violent or remains at the level of verbal abuse, or whether it is carried on in calm, cold tones, in a condition of feigned indifference, or by means of screams and shouts and slams, depends on the stamina, style, sex, and personality of the combatants, but most of all, upon the extent of its motivating distress, the depth of the anger that lies hidden beneath the battle like oil deep in the earth. Temporary truces may be made and a lull fall upon the field, but no quarrel concludes until it is clear that the quarrel will be remembered more vividly than its causes, until words have been spoken, blows struck, truths revealed, feelings exposed, dishes or furniture broken, which add fresh injuries to the old store. The satisfied quarrelers return to a pallid state of peace with new enormities to fasten onto history. The attack on Pearl Harbor, the destruction of Hiroshima as the fruits of their conflict. Physical violence is said to be the preferred recourse of the male. Taunting and recrimination are supposed to be the favorites of the female. In fact, women like to slap, men to tease and otherwise provoke. However, women have managed to persuade the world that beating them is the cruelest kind of quarrelsome exercise, as if bodily injuries were the worst sort. My father never laid a hand on me. Had he, I would have felt vindicated and hated him then for good and wholesomely acceptable reasons. Instead, he belittled me, cut me down to size, broke my ego's every bone, blackened my capital I, and left me less visibly scarred than did my adolescent acne. I guess I should add enormities to my list of elements in a quarrel. I said elements. Elements are not the same as stages. Will you ever get anything straight? Well, there are always enormities. My mother didn't say, down the hatch, when she put away the gin, which would have been an enormity in itself. But drinking the liquor was enormity enough. Enormities are notoriously relative. In the midst of the Holocaust, the murder of a few more Jews is not an enormity. G&I leaves such patterns in a too abbreviated or buried state, perhaps. G and I, not R and R, G and I. Dear me, my book, Das Meisterstücke, the object of my former life was to write it, and there it sits at my left hand like an empty glass. Yes, there it rests, so near. Yet I only dimly remember the text and its roll call of crimes, its sordid revelations, real villains, victims, vindications. I remember better mother's sodden body on the back step. I imagine better Bonnie Barley rewarding that sneak Lichelli with the roly-poly of her boobs, the soft pillow of her belly. I did tush her tuft once in a dry dream. Never ruffled Ruth's rough either. Never got below the waist. Lousy Catholic upbringing. Some sort of dumb social rule she came across in high school. And I wanted my mother to stand up and come in through the door like a wind and toss off another gin. Through the screen, hooked from within, I saw her sitting, jelly bleeding from the sandwich on the white plate beside her. There are no miracles in history, not in my auto bio either, nor in G and I. In the movies, in the funnies. These days, to be innocent is the worst crime. Slobweb number nine. And my white pile? It now serves to conceal these soiled and disgraced sheets and grows without growing, spontaneously, like a turvy topsy. 
Herschel, I think, is a kind of cruel copy editor, and I, alas, am often his hapless text. He replaces every which with that, and every that with which. He prefers commas to semicolons because commas are more noncommittal, comforting, egalitarian, and because he cannot be happy and still stay in harmony with the way I breathe. He faults my parallels. He snips off anything that dangles. He hates my elisions, my transpositions, my sloppy use of you and one. He invariably finds that my position hasn't the preferred spelling. He L.C.'s my heavily Germanic capitals, deletes my exclamations, eliminates italics, prefers the piece of parents to my more aggressive brackets, disputes every time the way I break ideas into images and dislikes single quotes. He says dots and dashes should be reserved exclusively for Morse. He always wants me to check my sources, moderate my intemperate verbs, if not their Latinate length, avoid the first person, words in bad taste, the present tense, the subjunctive mood, and the passive voice. He covers the margins of my mind with niggling little queries, which is to say he is a thorough P in that P art of the ace called crack. One summer, on vacation, we were motoring through New England. It was mid-morning. My mother suddenly caught sight of her left hand, ringless, in her lap, like a clutch of loose keys. I can still recall the indescribable soft sound she made. It wasn't raining, but nothing else about the weather now occurs to me. Apparently, she had left her wedding and engagement rings at the motel where we'd spent the previous night. My father took the loss of the rings hard. To share his sentiments, you did not have to have my father's character or my symbolic cast of mind, since it also meant a return trip of sixty or more miles. Unavoidable, of course, because the rings had to be retrieved. I was in the back seat where I could see the loss enter his spine like a stake. Maybe she had left them on the side of the sink. Perhaps they were still on the table by the bed. There would be no reason to have put them down in the outhouse someplace. It was likely even now that the shaving mirror was reflecting them. Every morning, when we had collected our things and loaded the car, my father would wipe the room with his eyes, just to be sure nothing of value was left behind. Nevertheless, the rings had been overlooked. They were on the nightstand, or the side of the sink, in the soap dish, on the glass shelf where the water glass stood. They were surely somewhere like that, if the old crone who cleaned hadn't pocketed them for good. My mother wept. In his cold, low, constricted voice, my father berated her as though her sorrow did not exist. Images of the old crone crossed the windshield. My mother wasn't able to find a handkerchief in her purse, and nobody helped her. All that aimless fumbling was just an additional annoyance. Her face seemed to slip down and drip from her chin. I was twelve, ten, caught in the car like a fly in a bottle. My eyes flew against the windows. There an image of the old crone appeared, suddenly like the spatter of a bug. I did not think I could endure the return journey. And then, after all that, suppose the rings were not recovered. There would be no remedy. Suppose my mother had absent-mindedly put them down in some odd, unrememberable place. Yet they had to be on the sill or the sink or between their beds folded over sheets. My father was speeding now, of course, but he was too angry to curse, 
as was his custom, the traffic that impeded us. The honesty of the couple who seemed to own the tourist court was briefly debated. I said nothing. My heart was choking on its own blood. No one, least of all myself, wanted to be reminded of my existence. If we could remember the name of the tourist court, we might phone. It was too easy to say no. On the phone, my father said, confrontation was the only recourse. As if the world were at an end, the road rolled toward us. Our horn blew suddenly as if a tire had blown. Maybe the rings had somehow got mislaid in the luggage, I believe, my mother finally suggested, and the car was roughly halted in a patch of buzzing grass while the trunk was opened and our baggage searched. Perhaps she had simply lost them in the trash and folds of her purse. After all, she was unable to locate a hanky. Perhaps they had fallen beneath a pillow. A passing truck shook the elevated trunk lid and light fluttered up from it as from a mirror. My father opened out a suitcase on the hood and began pawing through a stack of shirts. The old crone's left cheek was puffed as though she had a chaw in it. That's where the rings are, I thought. Sure enough, in the top tray of the small trunk where my mother kept her cosmetics, the rings were found, looking less large at that moment, I think I felt, than I had somehow remembered them. I can recall her deflationary sigh then, too. It was not of relief, but of another sort of despair. I stood by the road and watched my father watch my mother push her rings back on her marriage finger. They never went on easily. It was not as if a fresh troth were being plighted. Except for an occasional sniffle from my mother, neither made a significant noise or said even a short word the rest of the day. She's found the rings, I thought, so why are things worse? We hadn't lost our home or a loved one. We had lost nothing, as it turned out. Yet an enormity had occurred. I couldn't understand it. I was ten, eleven, twelve. I did not know there was no loved one to be lost. My mother wouldn't take her rings off after that, and they became encrusted with flour, I thought, old soap and dirt, until her fingers became infected and her whole hand burst. Then the doctor removed them. They weren't in the envelope of her belongings the hospital handed me after her death. We stayed in a cabin near a slipper-shaped lake that evening, and my mother and father walked arm in arm up the small rocky beach in the failing light. I shall never forget how grateful I was for the peace. It came as quietly as the darkness and was complete. If I am truly a man of peace, and I am such a man, then why am I always at war? The calm, untroubled life seems a contradiction. Even when it's cold outside, I boil within. At first Martha hated our quarrels as much as I did. But now I think she rather enjoys them. They give us something to do together, something which focuses our feelings. Perhaps matters will improve now that I've begun to dig. A little manual labor for the mind, a little secrecy in the public realm, a little indicative mood and active voice. The fart misleads the nose, Henry. I should practice hollering at him. The scowl confuses the eye. The lion's roar merely rattles the pains of the ear. Wars similarly leave not a false but an enticing trail, a ruin which represents another ruin, a ruin entirely intact, as buried in poisonous ash as Pompeii, as in dullness our dismayed 
the days of my life. Yes, to cover the pit. War, eloquence, art. Each wears a domino designed to be more interesting than the face behind it. I shall tell him that. Once, twice. Can you hold that in your helpful hand, Hershey? He flinches at the vulgar word, fart. Fa! Fireworks on the fourth. Hear them? Farting the heavens full, as if to take the stars apart. God's tender bowels run out galaxies of gas. Ah, the clouds explode. Oh, the sky is rent. Here comes the flag floating down. PB, PB, and the grand finale follows. What a rat a tat tat. Deaths by the baker's dozens. Cloth, skin, hair, bowels. Wow! Bowels bursting in air. Wow! Fart, art, tart, de fart. If that were the case, Herschel responds calmly, as if nothing had gone off. He's not even twisting his hanky. He's not even mopping his brow. If wars were like quarrels, he says, spooning a dubious tone over his words like sand on a Sunday, that is, like quarrels as you describe them, then the usual values we give to referent and sign would be reversed, wouldn't they? And servants would be served by their masters. A small fan lifts the corners of a pair of papers as it oscillates. Herschel claims that air conditioning gives him a sore throat, so he sits in a draft. You mentioned the scowl a moment ago, he says, his throat in good shape. But don't we always read the face like a paper, interested only in the news? Isn't that what a face is for? Doesn't the scowl speak of an annoyance elsewhere in the inner city? Give us a picture of the anger which shaped it. The fan's breath licks me unpleasantly, like a lover I no longer like. I wave the air away with my hand, but it is immediately back again. Wars, though, well, he says, wars aren't some posture put before the world or an expression on the face of an irascible nation to be read as we read the moon. To have sign and sense swap places so completely isn't that a mite radical, a mite strange, perverse even? A mite? Shouldn't we look closely at such a dexterous exchange? How dismally deferential Herschel is, how cautious, how picky, how mulish, how polite. He, but not his body, looks me in the eye. I am curious about those flapping papers weighted on one corner by, by a book by. I mean, he says, it's more than arguing that the occasion for the war or the bust-up or the quarrel, perhaps Culpe's thermonuclear tiff, isn't that his label? Well, the spark is often trivial and offset from its true cause. Culpe's label? Is it a pickle jar, the jam we're in? The way most genuine sparks are. Genuine? And what would a counterfeit spark ignite? A counterfeit catastrophe? And Culpe? My God! So that the true condition of affairs is somewhat hidden or disguised. The true condition of affairs, he said. Yes, what? What is the true condition of affairs? Well, we both know how frequently that happens. What happens? I take a peek at the papers while Hershey puts a common kitchen match to his idea. However distantly ignited, though, he says, I suspect the quarrel feeds on its grievances like a flame, always moving toward fresh fuel, so that we see what it's eating, and everything is ash behind its path. Ashes, injuries, dust, debris, dismay, looks like a couple of office memos curling up in a flame. Whereas what you are suggesting, Herschel says, ignoring, as if he were not privy to them, all the images of burning which I earlier applied to this particular problem, 
is that the entire conflict conceals its source by being so completely absorbing in itself, so devastating in terms of its own effects. Isn't that a fancy loop he's written there? An L. Lacelli's name? Lacelli. That it earns our total attention? Who calls culp culpy? No one I know. Is there, perhaps, an unexplored area of intimacy? And then Lacelli's name. All I can see. Shit. To a geologist, Herschel continues, while I melt in the heat and the fan laves my cheek and my suspicions mount. Yes, Herschel, to a geologist? To a geologist, a long, thin lake may be a sign of some far-gone glacial activity. But never mind, because the geologist, along with the rest of us, likes to go boating. He gives up the sign for the swimming.